Good morning. It's good to see you here with us this morning. I'm glad that each and every one of you are here, especially our visitors. We're certainly pleased to have your presence. I'm asking you to remain a little bit after services. Let us all get to greet you and get to know you and let you know how much we appreciate you being here with us this morning. We've been having several prayers, uh, sorry, uh, sermons, uh, prayer. And I want to pray to give you another one this morning about prayer this morning. Only this one's going to be aligned towards how the prayer should be executed and how it should be done. I've entitled this morning's lesson, What is an Effectual Prayer? Turn with me to James chapter 5 and verse 13. Starting with James chapter 5 and verse 13. Listen to what James has to say. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. This is the foundation scriptures for our lesson this morning. A gentleman uh, made a famous quote one time, and it's something that we need to think about. Prayer is very important. It's a very important part of who we are as Christians. Oswald Chambers said this, Prayer does not equip you for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. How great a statement is that? Prayer is essential in the life of a Christian. It is important, but not only that, beloved, prayer is something that we alone are able to do. God hears our prayers. How important is that? He answers our prayers. How important is that? We need to wake up and realize how important a part of our life prayer should be. It is important. Prayer is not something that we just do. When we get into these routines, we get into ruts, and we pray, but it's, we pray out of habit or we pray out of routine. We don't pray in the manner that we should. It is a vital connection with our Heavenly Father that no one else can have. It is a precious thing that we have to commune with the Father in prayer. Prayer is not just a privilege, it is an awesome responsibility. It is a responsibility and it needs to be thought of in that way. It can include God in situations that normally there seems to be no hope for. There are lots of situations in this world today there seems to be no hope, isn't there? We can turn on the news and see that, can't we? Beloved, our prayers can include God and His will in those situations and change them in ways the world can't visualize. But we, as children of God, can. <coughs> I've heard this statement once before, and it's, it's true in a lot of ways if you listen to it. Prayer can be compared to the dove that Noah sent out of the ark. It blessed him, not only when it returned with an olive branch or a leaf in his mouth, but also blessed him when it didn't return. Beloved, well, there are lots of times we'll pray and we'll look for that answer, but it doesn't come in the way we're expecting it to come. 
But that doesn't mean God didn't answer your prayer. We need to pray. And we need to con continually pray. Pray without ceasing, we're told in the Bible. Because God does hear it. And the answer we receive, love, will not always be what we expect. But know assuredly that it will be for our good. Because that is what God seeks in our life. That dove didn't come back. But it came back for a good reason, didn't it? God had answered the prayer. And God kept His word. In James chapter 5, verse 16, where we read it just a moment ago. The effectual, fervent prayer is mentioned there. These are the prayers that we want. We want the effectual prayers. We want results. We want results. But what are effectual prayers? What are those? I challenge you to think of this. Effectual prayers are performed and done when a person is right with God. And the power of the sincere prayer of the end is tremendous. When a person is right with God. We need to make sure that our life is right with God. We're told very clearly that when we come before the altar, if we can remember any fault with our brother, any, any situation with our brother that needs to be resolved, we're to lay down our sacrifice and go and make it right with our brother, then come back. That's how important God wants our life to be in alignment with His will. Prayer is a part of our worship of God. It needs the same consideration. We need to make sure our life is right. And when it is right, beloved, our prayers are powerful and tremendous in this power. Because it has God answering. And there's no greater power in our life than God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it's where Paul tells us about examining ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves. Look at yourself. You often hear me use the example about when we get up in the morning and we look in the mirror. Well, it's the same thing. We need to look in that mirror and look at ourselves and look at our life and examine ourselves. All that we say, all that we do throughout the day is important. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove that your own or test yourself. Test yourself to see whether you are what? In the will of God the way you're supposed to. Paul says, Know ye not that your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate? Examine yourself whether you're in the faith or not. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Because our prayers are dependent upon that. Not only our destiny and our souls, but so are our prayers. They're dependent on our doing what's right. Worldly men. Worldly men tend to always look at the circumstance, the situation. And they think that some situations are impossible. And pull back from praying. That shouldn't be one of us. We can look at any situation and realize there's nothing too great for God. Nothing too awesomely difficult for God to resolve in our lives or in the lives of others. For we are we are afraid for others are we not. Nothing is too great for God to handle. Worldly men tend to hesitate to pray. Thinking that, oh, that won't do any good. That person is too far gone. That situation's out of control, blah blah blah. And they hesitate to pray. That shouldn't be one of us. Worldly men often look at themselves or others. They look to themselves or others to resolve the situation. They look to themselves or others for help and they neglect to pray. So much so that it's hard for them to think of God's power in their lives. 
We should never let the world overwhelm us to the point that we leave God out of any given situation. God should be so much the center of our lives in every situation that we think of Him first. We think of God first. We think of His will first. When we get up in the morning, we think of what can I do for God today? I'm a child of God. My prayer matters. My prayers are powerful because God answers them. What can I do? For the lost today. What can I do for God today? That's the way we need to think. Don't think like the world. Think like a child of God. My Father loves me. My Father is with me. My Father is in my heart. His word is in my heart. What can I do for God today? That's the way we need to be thinking. Our prayers count on that way of thinking. Let's look at an example of a fervent prayer. God gives us examples so we know how to pray and what to pray for. Think about Peter for a minute. Peter was in prison awaiting his execution. The church had neither human nor power nor influence in order to help him. There was no earthly help, but there was help to be obtained by way of heaven. They gave themselves to a fervent, important prayer. God sent his angel who aroused Peter from sleep and led him through out through the first and second wards of the prison. And when they came to the iron gate, it opened of its own accord and Peter was free. You need to think about this situation for a moment. Peter was in trouble. And he was put into prison. And this was no ordinary prison. He was locked in the center area of the prison where there was no way of him getting out of that prison without waking someone else up, going through iron gates, going through doorways, going around and over other people to make noise. No way possible. And not only that, he had two guards sleeping with him, one on one side, one on the other, and he was chained with two chains to the floor. Talk about an impossible situation. That would be one worldly men would look at as impossible. And Peter got out of it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, starting with verse 5. And let's see what the scriptures have to say about this prayer. And about Peter's escape. Acts chapter 12, verse, starting with verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Well, are we told, told to pray without ceasing? Here we have another reminder of that. They prayed for him without ceasing. They didn't give up. They were fervent in their prayer. Verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. And the keepers were before the door, kept the prison. He was locked up tight. And something about the Roman soldiers. Their life was bound to their prisoners. If their prisoners escaped, they knew they were going to be put to death. So you know they were being vigilant. You know they were watchful. Verse 7. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell from off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And when he went out and followed him, and Wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought it was in a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, that's how far inside the prison they were, they came into the iron gate that leadeth them to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. An impossible situation. 
One that the world would give up on and the average person would think impossible. But the church didn't give up. They prayed for him and know surely Peter prayed as well. There is no situation that God cannot resolve. We need to understand what it is to have a fervent and effectual prayer. Think on this. Beloved, are you listening? Prayer has divided the seas and rolled up flowing rivers and made rocks gush forth mountains, quenched flames of fire, muzzled lions, disarmed vipers and poisons, stopped the course of the moon, arrested the sun in his rapid race, burst open iron gates, conquered the strongest devils, commanded legions of angels down from heaven. Prayer has bridled and chained raging passions of men and routed and destroyed vast armies. Prayer has brought one man to the bottom of the sea, remember Jonah, and carried another in the chariot of fire to heaven. What has prayer not done? We cannot put a limit on prayer. If we do, we put a limit on God. And God is infinite, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere at any given moment. We cannot limit God. Therefore, we cannot and should not limit our prayer. We need to understand what it is for an effectual prayer. We need to understand that. What is it that makes our prayer effectual or effective? Fervent prayer is putting your whole self, all of your intention, your mind, your will, and your emotions on that thing you're praying about. That means your mind is focused on prayer. How many of us say prayer and even here in worship service, but our mind is on what we're going to have for lunch. Or what we're going to do this afternoon. Or where we're going to go have fun after church. Our mind isn't in the worship service, therefore our prayer is not focused either. We need to have a heart and mind in what we're doing. Fervent prayer will make a difference in the lives of people, our lives as well as others. We need to know that. But we must understand that it takes an effort and a sacrifice of our time. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 22 through 28, we find the Canaanite woman, a story about her. She would not take no for an answer. She asked for her daughter's healing three times and she was rejected. Three times. But she wouldn't give up. She understood the heart and character of the Lord Jesus. She not only received the healing of her daughter, but she was commended by Jesus when he said to her, Woman, you have great faith. See, we need to not give up on prayer. This is important. It, is praying in our lives, we shouldn't stop praying. We shouldn't pray once and say, okay, I've done it. I've said, I prayed. God heard me. No, you see, when our heart and our mind is involved with it, then our emotions are involved in whatever situation it's in. Our emotions are what God listens to as well. When we're praying for someone we love, someone we care about who's ill, our emotions are there. Do we pray just one time and say, well, that's enough? No, it's on our heart and our mind. We are, care we are caring and we're worrying and maybe even suffering. It's going to be there. And if it's on our heart and mind, we need to pray about it. James gives us Elijah as an example of an effective prayer. In James chapter 17, uh, 5, 17 and 18, is where he talks about him stopping the rain and starting to rain again. Let's look at that story for a moment. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 
First Kings chapter 17, starting with verse 1. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now listen about that for a moment. He prayed about there not being rain. And the Lord answered his prayer. Listen to his thoughts when he said that. He was certain that God would hear his prayer. He knew his life was right with God and his life was in the line with God's will and therefore God heard his prayer and he knew God would answer it. Remember we read that a moment ago together about examining ourselves. We need to make certain our life is right with God and know for certain that when we are right with God, God hears our prayers. End of story. Turn with me to verse 18 now. I'm sorry, chapter 18, 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 41 45. Listen to Elijah. Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Again, a positive attitude. He knew God was going to listen to him. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah went up to the top of the Car of Carmel and cast down himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. A submissive attitude. And he said to his servant, Go now, up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said again seven times. Seven times he sent his servant up and back and he was praying the whole time. Again, an example of what being uh, having a fervent prayer means. He didn't just pray once and let it go. He was determined that God would hear him. He was, it was on his heart and his mind. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there arises the little cloud out of the sea, like a man's hand. And he said, Go up and say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heavens was black with clouds and the wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Israel. Listen to what's happening here. He's being fervent in his prayer. He's adamant about the prayer. And he knows that God's answering just a little tiny spot on the horizon. Oh, God's answered my prayer. You better get with it and get down. Elijah was adamant, fervent, and believing that his prayer would be answered. But he prayed effectually. Elijah's prayer was based on what? On the Word of God. How do we know it was based on the Word of God? Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and let's look at verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 11, starting with verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my command, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in His due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle and for thy, for thou, thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. 
And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, and lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Israel had turned away to serve other gods. That's why Elijah prayed. He knew these scriptures. He prayed according to what God's word. That's what makes your prayer effective. You pray for the will of God to be done. We need to learn that. The effectual prayer then is a prayer that is based on God's word. When we know the process that he has given, or promises that he has given, and understand his character and the principles by which he is for, he works, and he and the desires he has revealed in his word, we can pray with confidence and authority, knowing that our prayers will be answered. You have not because you ask not, or you ask and you ask amiss. We need to learn to pray according to the will of God. We need to examine ourselves and make sure that we are right with God. And beloved, there's nothing we cannot do. Because God is on our side. You want your prayers answered. You want to have an effectual prayer life. You want to know that your prayers are being answered. Beloved, God is waiting for you to make sure your part is done right. You make your life right with Him. And you pray according to His will. And there's nothing that together we cannot do. That is an effectual fervent prayer in Elliston. If you're here this morning and you need to make your life right with God, an opportunity is being extended to you right now. You need to put your Lord on in baptism that you might take your first steps with Him as a child of God and your prayers will begin to be answered. Now's your time to do that. If you are a child of God and you strayed, you stumbled, you haven't done things right and you know you've made mistakes, God loves you. God is desiring for you to repent and come back to Him. All we have to do is help you to do that. And we're here to do that right now. Whatever needs you have in Christ, we love you. God certainly does. Won't you come? All together we stand and invite you in song.